ones come. I say hopefully in that they will be ready before. Uh, I hope we get them soon because we need them. Um, so next, CWCB, again, Colorado Water Conservation Board, they have a watershed restoration grant program. And I just want to uh, articulate this is separate from EWP. Um, this is a unique funding in that the, the goal is really a holistic restoration of the watershed from top to bottom. These monies can be used for uh, private land, for public land. It can be actual structures to protect the lives and property if needed, but it can also be revegetation and reseeding and um, kind of more you know, stream restoration type projects. Um, and so the CWCB uh, program uh, kind of breaks it to five steps. One is to identify areas of risk. We've got great resources like the FAIR report, uh, NRCS with EWP certainly uh, identified a lot of the areas and we've got flooding that we've seen since the 416 fire. So those are, that's where we're focusing. Um, the second uh, piece is to identify the source areas. Again, this is the, the 416 fire burn area. So we're looking at the bear report and really those high severity burn areas. And then we've gotten recent aerial photos that we're looking um, and, and starting our field uh, analyses. Third is to identify the transport mechanism, which is predominantly rain. And um, fourth, looking at the depositional areas. Um, and so uh, again, bear and NRCS and, and flooding and talking to a lot of landowners and we've had stakeholder engagement and have gotten uh, excellent feedback and input from a lot of folks uh, that we'll report on today and uh, definitely helping guide this process. And then uh, last is the assess and prioritize projects and then to working towards uh, implementation. So uh, I gave a similar presentation in March and it was really about what we're going to do. And at this point, I kind of wanted to share what we've been able to do. Um, so since that March ARC forum meeting, uh, we had a virtual focus group meeting uh, towards the end of March talking with key stakeholders that could uh, guide our dialogue and thought processes we planned these. Uh, we prepared an online survey. I'll give a couple of the results from that um, and really to uh, allow another uh, avenue to obtain uh, information and feedback from folks, get ideas for projects and uh, document that as well. Um, at the end of April, we had a stakeholders workshop. I think it started at 5.30 in the evening and we had almost 50 participants was uh, which was a great surprise that we, that we had that much and had a lot of active dialogue. Um, since then, we've had ongoing coordination with the US Forest Service uh, staff, uh, landowners, and other stakeholders um, uh, that are offered areas of expertise or interested in the project. Um, and then we've begun our desktop mapping analysis and uh, we're starting our preliminary field investigations. Um, so, uh, Couple of things just wanted to share. Um, we had over surveys, older, I'm sorry, over 80 online surveys completed. We were pretty pleased uh, with the number of respondents. Um, and so from this, this chart, you can see, you know, most of the folks that, um, uh, that replied or, or provided input is this blue column here, uh, property owners. Um, but we also got information from agricultural operators, business owners, engineers, environmental stewards, government employees, homeowners associations, uh, recreationists, and the other was a um, ditch board member. So we got, uh, I think, a, a pretty good response. And we also got a, a kind of a wide cross section of the community, I think. Um, and part of the uh, discussion we had at the stakeholders workshop and then within the survey itself was to rank uh, various priorities within the restoration process. Um, there's no right or wrong. There's different things that we could look at, but what we wanted was, and, and what CWCB wants with this grant money is that we have uh, public input and stakeholder involvement. And so um, the number one thing we heard are the most important uh, types of projects, um, as you can see here, were projects that reduce sediment uh, deposition and or uh, reduce the amount of uh, debris removal that's needed. Uh, number two was uh, upland revegetation projects. Third was public safety. Um, Megan Graham is not able to attend today, um, um, but at various meetings and, and 
we certainly acknowledge that a lot of these um, actual priorities um, inherently protect public safety or uphold public safety, um, but there's some projects that uh, directly uh, maybe focus on that a little bit more. Uh, the fourth priority uh, based on, on feedback was remote telemetry and early warning systems for flooding uh, after remote rainstorms. Uh, fifth was riparian corridor uh, vegetation projects, kind of stream restoration uh, projects. Sixth would be mitigating impacts to agricultural uh, and or irrigation systems. Uh, seventh was improving habitat for aquatic life. And then eighth was uh, recreational access. Um, so as we go forward um, and begin our field analyses and talk with folks, um, what we'll basically do is look at the projects that we see in the field that we think are viable, work with the right stakeholders, U.S. Forest Service, figure out what we can and can't do. And then from there, uh, we're working on coming up with cost and then seeing, okay, based on cost and, and these rankings and, and feasibility of implementing these projects, what can we get done? And so um, the project areas that were identified based on you know, the bear report, what we've seen in flooding, as well as input from stakeholders uh, and landowners um, are on this, on this figure here. It's a zoom in basically of the 416 fire burn area and um, kind of the light blue are all the, the creeks and, and tributaries, dark blue are the sub watersheds and then the white boxes are the, the kind of focus areas. And so um, from south to north, I certainly don't want to uh, make it seem like any one sub watershed is more important than another, uh, just numbered them from south to north and, and kind of how we're uh, physically walking through them. But uh, Dyke Canyon, um, the waterfall drainage, this is the drainage just north of Dyke Canyon uh, behind Falls Creek, um, Trip Gulch, uh, Buck Hollow, Mitchell Lakes, Bell Canyon, uh, Armosa Creek, and then uh, Bondurant and Dutch Creeks. And so those are the, the primary areas of focus that we're looking at. And based on um, the information input we heard really within um, both Dyke Canyon waterfall drainage behind Falls Creek, uh, the projects of, of most need there are upland stabilization uh, projects and upland reveg as well as uh, stream channel stabilization and, and revegetation um, so that the watershed can uh, really uh, restore and hold the water that comes down and then that there's protective measures in place that can hold a lot of the debris and prevent flooding up there. Um, the next drainage, Trip Creek, uh, over and over we heard the importance of and the need for uh, a debris barrier or physical structure that uh, can help hold back a lot of the, the sediment and rocks that are coming down the drainage uh, based on some of the monsoon uh, rains and uh, that, have, that we've seen in the last couple of years. Uh, following that was upland stabilization and reveg. Uh, the kind of third thing we heard was remote early flood detection and warning systems. Um, there's a couple of uh, irrigation systems there that when uh, the stream gets plugged with mud, uh, the sooner they know that they can turn off the head gates and prevent, help prevent flooding or their infrastructure from plugging, uh, that's really helpful as well as for the landowners uh, that live right along Trip Creek. And then uh, kind of lastly is that stream channel stabilization and revegetation. Um, continuing up north, if you go to Buck Creek, it's the upland stabilization reveg, remote early flood detection warning system, and stream channel stabilization. Um, Mitchell Lakes, uh, very similar type projects. There was also, John Ott identified that the potential need for a debris barrier, that there's um, a channel that's in size, and there's a lot of material that could come down with a big uh, storm. So we will be evaluating that soon. Uh, Bell Canyon, also a debris barrier, and then the upland stabilization reveg and uh, channel uh, stabilization and, and uh, repairing and revegetation. And then the, the last couple of, of areas are Mosa Creek, um, upland stabilization reveg, stream channel stabilization reveg. Uh, we, we heard uh, in the workshop the need for the evalu 
evaluation of log jams and, and public safety concerns. Um, it's an interesting dialogue. There's, there's a lot of material that's built up and the, the, the question that was raised is with a big flood, you know, are there uh, either homes or, or people in the river that could be damaged and what, um, what could be done to mitigate that? Um, uh, Scott Roberts and, and others on the call so identified that log jams help hold sediment and are good for um, aquatic habitat. And so we're going to be uh, looking at kind of evaluating are there uh, safe log jams and would be good for um, aquatic habitat and then what are the ones that are maybe just kind of the, the biggest risk for public safety. For Mosa Creek we also uh, the, the need for trail maintenance and or reroutes where the creek um, is actually kind of flowing through the trail or some of these drainages are now uh, flowing over the trail and then there's a a bridge at Big Bend that's, that's actually in the creek and, and there's other bridges that need maintenance and, and so those are projects that we're looking at. And then in Bondurant and Dutch Creek, uh, upland stabilization, reveg, and stream channel stabilization and reveg. So I know it sounds like a lot of the same and it is, but each uh, individual um, drainage we're going to you know, look at individually and, and tackle and, and address as we can. Uh, for each specific site. So kind of immediately we've, we've started this desktop analysis um, to see how the forest has grown back. This is actually a picture from yesterday in, in Dyke Canyon, uh, Chris of Falls Creek Ranch and uh, Amanda and I went back and, and had, a, had a great tour and, and it's amazing to see some of the, the aspens and choke cherry and scrub oak that's, that's come back so quickly. And, and uh, this picture just testifies, you know, it was, uh, Pretty much everything was burned to the ground, and and two years later we we have uh, vegetation that's a couple feet tall, uh, so that was very encouraging. Um, and so we're we're looking at some aerial photos, and I'm going to show some examples. We're coordinating with landowners and stakeholders who have got some boots on the ground experience and said, hey, I want to take you back there. So some of our staff are reaching out and coordinating with those folks to get those trips planned and our initial um, field evaluations done and once that then leads into the, the field verification part. So this is an example. Um, we, interestingly enough, the uh, aerial uh, photography that's available in 2018, I think it's June 8th is when the, the flights were flown. So uh, eight days after the fire started and actually right along 550, you can see the plumes of smoke. So this, this map does an excellent job of, of characterizing the force that existed days before uh, it got burned. And so here I'm focusing again on, on Dyke Creek. The blue line is the sub watershed boundary and the red is the high severity uh, burn areas that were delineated in the bear report. This next figure is uh, aerial photography that's available uh, September of last year. So um, this is post fire. It would have been at the tail end of the, you know, the, not necessarily ir irrigation season, but at the end of, of kind of the growing season. And there's not a whole lot of green that, that's available, but you definitely see um, where there's still some standing trees and there's some growth going back. And you can also see that the areas have just been completely reduced and um, there's no, no cover or trees left. So I'll uh, go back to 2018, again, June, and then 2019. So pretty stark contrast. We're Fortunate this uh, photography is available. I'm gonna zoom in, you probably saw there's this dashed orange line at the bottom. Part of the desk, uh, desktop evaluation, this um, September photography that's available, um, it's one foot uh, resolution. And so we're really able to zoom in. I'll uh, go to the next slide. And this zoomed in photo, I know, I know it's not super clear, um, but that is um, basically a, a section of what we we're looking at in that dashed orange line. You can see here, you can see my cursor, uh, there's a really incised channel, and then there's kind of this lobe right here of sediment and debris uh, that goes along. You can see kind of the, the green vegetation on the trail, and then this lobe of, of material. So yesterday when uh, Chris took us up there, uh, this is actually in 2019, they had some avalanche activity. And so we're kind of staring up the hillside here at that incised channel 
and uh, the debris that's come down. You can see again overall how well the um, the, the this drainage has, has started to heal and the vegetation that's coming back, but there's certainly some uh, problematic areas and some spots in this drainage that could use some uh, additional reveg. So these are the, the things that we're doing to kind of identify what are the real target zones that we want to focus on. Um, again, um, kind of on the forest service or in just into the uh, private property um, to, to try to maximize the benefit of these, of these uh, efforts. And in addition, uh, last September, they also uh, flew uh, uh, infrared light alongside. And so um, the, the red actually um, indicates healthy vegetation. So this is the infrared. And so when you see that red color, this is the amount of, of, of uh, healthy vegetation we're seeing. So that 2019 photo doesn't actually show a lot of green per se, but when we look at the infrared, uh, photos, um, if you will, you can see that where we've got red is, is where we're seeing uh, healthy uh, vegetation reestablishing. And so this also helps us to focus on these uh, bare spots that aren't showing the, the, the sign of, of reveg, and that is, is guiding our field evaluations. And another photo from, from yesterday, and you can see how green things are. And at one point, uh, you know, we were talking about Things aren't going to grow on the on the cliffs, and and they weren't growing before, and they're just too steep. And then we look up, and there's this cliff section here, and there's still things growing in between, kind of the cliff bands. So very encouraging to see how well uh, this particular area is starting to reveg. And as we talk to folks, we hear over and over they're seeing a lot of the same things in in most uh, Creek proper and, and a lot of these other drainages. So from here, uh, our steps. Again, we're coordinating with landowners and stakeholders. We're verifying in the field. Um, what we then, after we do this, will uh, develop some conceptual projects. We need to identify kind of specific areas, uh, trails that need to be uh, worked over and, and restored, or, or bridges, or specific acreages of, of reveg, uh, really incised channels, and where we can lay those back and do some. Uh, willow plantings and, and stream restoration projects, uh, potential sites for those early warning systems, uh, as well as locations for some of those debris barriers. Um, with those conceptual projects, then we can come up with a preliminary cost estimate. Uh, from there, we'll look at the, the uh, prioritization that we saw from uh, the stakeholders on uh, the watershed priorities and which ones do we want to focus on. So we'll kind of rank the projects and look at how much each one uh, will cost and see how many we can get done for the budget that we have and, and you know, try to uh, do the best um, improvement with the money that we have and we'll go from, uh, go from there. We've been coordinating with uh, James Simino at the U.S. Forest Service and um, he is, is open, the Forest Service is open for a cooperative agreement and so we're talking to him about that. Um, and, and he really wants to see specific projects and, and areas and things that we will focus on as we start that cooperative agreement. And a part of that will be identifying the NEPA requirements associated with those activities. And so um, we're trying to work on this, um, on these uh, kind of parallel paths. And then um, once we develop that cooperative agreement, um, then we'll start the NEPA compliance and the design and then eventually we'll get to, to construction. So um, with that, I know I said a lot and threw a lot at you guys, but uh, happy to entertain questions. Um, and uh, just thank you all for your time and for all the support we've had through these uh, projects. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Jordan. Um, if you have a question, uh, please use the uh, reaction tool to raise your hand. I don't know if we should have gone over that at the beginning, but if you see at the bottom of your screen, you kind of hover your mouse, there's uh, reactions will come up and you, you, can, uh, you can raise your hand. I'm not seeing anyone uh, with a question. 
Uh, Jordan, maybe I just will ask you, what's the overall timeline that you hope to be doing construction on the ground? Um, we would love to do construction late summer, early fall, into the fall. Uh, it's certainly contingent upon um, permitting and, and getting CWCB approval. They'll be reviewing all the designs and projects. So uh, I think best case this fall, uh, and it you know may turn into we're also you know wrapping things up next spring and or summer. Great, that's wonderful. Um, Okay, well, if there are no further questions, um, kind of going once, going twice, uh, maybe we'll move on. I've actually, um, we're going to make a quick um, change to the schedule, and we're going to hear from the Animus Watershed Partnership next um, in front of Evan Fricke, who will speak about the Animus, the Our Animus story map. So um, at this time, let me see here, what do I need to do? I, Warren, are you still there? Yeah, I am. Great. So do you have a, um, do you have I, a PowerPoint? I didn't put one together for this. Um, I thought I would just give people an update, introduce myself, and let folks ask questions if they wanted to. Evan, I apologize for jumping in front of you. I have a little boy that needs to get picked up here shortly. <laughs> um, so I apologize, but I'll be relatively brief. Um, I'm Warren Ryder, so it's nice to meet everyone, Let's see everyone here. I started as the Animus Watershed Project Coordinator a little over a month and a half ago, I'd say. And, but I've been involved with that group off and on for, oops, sorry about that. Um, off and on for probably the last six or seven years. Um, beginning with the time when I was working for BHP Billiton, we supported them as well as the San Juan Watershed Group down in Farmington on various projects. And I did that as a BHP employee. Um, I work as a hydrologist here in Durango as well. So it's kind of wearing a couple different hats, but it ultimately all sort of makes me a dork when it comes to water, which gets me pretty excited about working with the partnership. Um, when I saw that, Having worked with Anne and the whole group, when I saw that posting come up, I thought that this was a pretty cool opportunity to kind of carry, you know, take the torch from Anne and all the work that she'd done and, and continue that. So what we're sort of, as many of you probably know, Anne and the partnership worked for a number of years on the Florida near the, starting near with the airport and owners down there to rehabilitate about two miles of, um, of channel. It included everything from livestock fencing to irrigation improvements, and then a fair bit of bank stabilization and, and revegetation with willow sting. That's wrapped up. We were out there, to what, two, almost two weeks ago, just to do an evaluation of that. And a lot of the willows have um, that were planted, I believe, in 2016, um, have taken and are stabilizing, and the channel has further eroded. That project being completed through there, we're, we're working now on a grant that Anne and the steering committee met, um, were awarded from the Bureau of Reclamation, and Melissa did amazing work to get that the dates on that moved forward so we could continue with that grant. And what that's doing is looking at the subwatershed on the Florida below Lemon, so everything below the, the control structure, to look at restoration opportunities within the Florida itself as well as tributaries um, in order to improve habitat, water quality, restore banks, and the ultimate goal is to identify landowners similar to what Anne and the group did down lower um, who want to really take a good look at their at their section of channel and do improvements um, for the ultimate goal of improving the habitat and, and sort of quality of that river. So that's what we're working on right now. Um, it's starting out initially with a large scale mapping exercise to look at you know, where we have opportunities, where the water quality data suggests we need improvements, and then identifying those potential landowners and um, 
and reaching out to them to see who would be willing and to what extent they'd be willing to let us start suggesting some restoration improvement projects on the ground. Um, outside of the Florida image, you know, just looking, looking at it as an animus watershed partnership, I'm really excited to engage the rest of the partners to see where we can sort of combine efforts and, and start expanding outside of the Florida and giving, you know, bringing our expertise in to support those other folks active in other parts of the drainage as well to make it one big watershed scale organization and effort with the partners. Um, so that's kind of where I am and, and where I see it going. And I'm excited to get working with partners. Thanks so much, Warren. Um, Melissa, do you have anything you want to add? Oh. I just I just decided to let Warren take the lead and, and I'm just here for moral support. Um, I, I offered to field questions for things that happened but before he got here so he wouldn't be put on the spot. But um, I'm really excited for the potential of partnering on some of this our animus stuff. So I think that the the story map and the document you guys have been working on is just a just a truly awesome uh, outreach resource and a way to connect everybody in the watershed to a lot of these more scientific issues that a lot of us water nerds have been spending a lot of time thinking about. And so I think there really are a ton of possibilities to um, do additional outreach and plan new projects that kind of intersect a lot of these separate issues, the, the fire, the agricultural, the wastewater treatment, all, all of these different things. And so um, we're really excited to have Warren on board and be able to have the, the manpower now to take advantage of some of those opportunities when they come up. That's great. Does anyone have additional questions for Warren and or Melissa? Hmm. I don't see any questions. Um, please speak up if I'm just not seeing it. Okay, well, thank you both so much. Oh, wait, I have a message. Okay, great. Looks like we don't have any questions. Thank you both so much for coming today and, and sharing with us. And I think stick around as long as I can. Okay. Um, next, we'd like to hear from Evan Fricky. And then Evan, I'll make you a co-host here so that you can share your screen. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you. Okay, hello everybody. Like I said, um, my name's Evan and I'm at Fort Lewis College in the GIS program. And I did an internship with MSI to convert your ARCF um, document into the new modified estuary story map program which is accessible through Mountain Studies website. And so I'm just going to share my screen and show you all how to um, access it, where it is, and then I'll run through it and show you kind of how it's laid out and how I kept it as it was as much as possible. Um, let's see. Okay, there we go. So here's the uh, MSI um, website, and up here under research, Animus River Monitoring. That takes us to this right here, this page, Animus River Monitoring, 416 footage. And here's this button, May 2020, our Animus Educational Publication, now available as a story map. And so you can just click on that button there and it takes you to the story map. And I've got really low bandwidth at my house. Um, so I'm going to actually walk you all through it through the, from the ESRI program. Um, and this is, this is all uploaded onto the, the MSI website. So this is what you'll be seeing. Um, so here it is basically a translation or duplication in some sense of the words um, from the original document, uh, 2019 edition at least, 
um, into digital format where the user user can access it, education um, education facilities can access it, and keeping the overall outlook of it, the overall layout of it, and the idea of it together as much as possible. So here you will see the the nine questions that you all came up with, nine essential questions. Um, we have this is our animus. This takes us to the main idea. We have drinking water, recreation, food, fish, wildlife, overall function, quality of life, impacts, and then updates, which is added um, in this version, and then our acknowledgments and sponsors. So we'll just walk through, I'll just scroll through the entire um, document here. And it turned out quite lengthy, as you all know from the original. Um, so yeah, lots of images, lots of information. And basically, it was everything that, um, that you all provided in the original document. And this one actually has links. So links to uh, sponsors, links to organizations that helped out, links to more information that, that a user might want, to, might want to look into. So here we are. Here's the nine questions um, listed in order. And you can always come up here to this ribbon to click. So I can click on quality of life, overall function, fish and wildlife. Um, and then this part here, this is the user-friendly user interactive piece. Um, a, lot of, a lot of times I added the, when there's questions from the document that actually pertain to the viewer, um, I put these into this lateral moving um, interactive piece here with information and photos. Um, so it came down, <clears throat> question number one, the associated uh, figure and all the information. And also, uh, also with photo credits and figure credits and that kind of thing. Um, and then this is a piece I added to the document, just a, a, a map of um, basically where we live and where the water comes from that's referenced in the, in the, um, in the PDF. So we have the greater, greater area of Colorado, New Mexico, Silverton area, Durango, and Farmington um, with subsequent water sources named in a map. And here's another interactive interactive element. Okay, and for the resources, all with with links attached to them. So whether a person is on their, their desktop computer or their iPhone or Android, they can click on links as they as they wish. So again, we'll just move through Move through the document here. There were some great photos to use too, really good ones. Okay, and more figures. I'm just running through this. If anyone has any questions, feel free to speak up um, while I'm while I'm running through here. Like I say, nothing nothing was specifically added. There were some changes that had to be made for the, just based on the format of the program, but they were very minor and very insignificant. Um, <clears throat> Okay, now we're 
we're getting into quality of life. Question number six, how is the Amnesty River important to your quality of life? Further resources. Number seven, impacts. Um, this one had to include all of the impacts from the questions just based on the number of ribbons that showed up here. So all of the impacts from the original document fall under this, under this heading here. And again, further resources with links. Question number eight. Let's see here. And number nine, more impacts. <clears throat> so here's the piece that was added. Um, this is the updates tab that uh, MSI decided would be good to add. And they can um, include, include links for anything they create, any story maps or any other information that's out there. Um, and add you know what it is, what what is actually affecting the river, um, and then obviously the date. So as time goes on and there are more updates, these are all just samples that I, I plugged in here. So they will be MSI will be adding or including updates to this with links to more information of the events that are affecting the Animus River. And then acknowledgments and sponsors. So here we are acknowledging contributing authors with all the links that were available um, in the editors and graphic design. And then all the sponsors that were that were in that original document with, with their subsequent logos and links as they as they fit in. And that's the that's the end of the document. So I'm gonna go back up here and share. Okay. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions or want to see something else in that? It might have been pretty fast, um, but it's all accessible there on, on the website. There's some chats here, so I'm going to read, see if there's any questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for okay. praise for your good work. Oh, oh, thanks, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, if, yeah. If there's no, if there's not any questions, I mean, it was essentially, you know, translating the document that you all had already created, um, and just organizing it and providing creating a structure that fit within the structure of the S3 um, story map style. And that was kind of the trick to the puzzle. So nice work on the original. I yeah. Agree. And it looks like Paul had a question thanks about water supply, um, but I think I saw drinking water on there. Is that was that one of the categories? Yes, yep. um, that was something new that Evan thought to put in. But Paul, do you want to clarify your question? Um, I don't know if you can unmute yourself. Um, that it, did you mean just that there was a slide for drinking supply, and Evan can show it again. This one. That's the slide I was thinking of. Is this, someone has a question? Well, Paul had asked in the chat, have you thought about including water supply? And I'm not oh, wa sure. Water supply, like um, municipal supply or there's like different than this, I guess, is, I don't, I'm not really. We had, Amanda, we had talked about, you know, that brainstorm that as an idea in terms of usage um, for towns and that kind of thing, but it didn't, it didn't develop any further than, than this, drinking water sources, if that helps any, I'm not quite sure. So, yeah, uh, Paul, I guess that's a bigger question for MSI. Um, that's outside of my 
my scope if they want to <laughs> add and change the document. <laughs> so he said water supply and the watershed for overall supply. So um, maybe getting to um, questions around snowpack and um, like how much we. Um, this is Alyssa. Maybe it's Paul. Do you mean in reference to climate change? Where are you, Paul? I know Paul <laughs> usually signs in on his desktop, so he I don't think he has access to a oh. microphone on okay. there. Um, but that's pro that's one of the things that I think there's a lot of rabbit holes we could follow pretty far down and like Bureau of Reclamation and like the snow tell and some of those things like there are really great uh, forecasting agencies that spend a lot of time and energy on forecasting what the acre feet of water and percent of average water year and stuff. So that might be the kind of questions he's getting at and maybe um, could be added in like the additional resources or something like that. The, uh, this is Marcel here, um, the San Juan Citizens Alliance. <laughs> we, uh, um, the group is looking at developing the next iteration of our Animus met last week and we actually talked about what, what new things we might add or, or what things we might expand upon for the next version and water supply did come up as well as snowpack and what the impacts of climate change might be on that. And we kind of generally really like the format of our animus and the questions that it asks because it allows us to fit whatever we wanna focus on into the next version. Um, and so water supply is definitely something that, that we talked about and we're gonna to continue to brainstorm over the next year or so in developing the next, our animus. Awesome. And Paul said, water supply for improving the environment. Snowpack does impact wildlife as well as people. Um, <clears throat> right, I know that that's actually a big um, issue moving forward in stream management planning about in-channel water supply. Um, yeah, I think these are all issues that we can include in the next iteration of the R Animus document. Um, this is this is Alyssa. Um, Evan, this is more so of a, of a comment than a question, but I just want to really thank you for all the work that you put together for this. Um, and Christine, for your, your presentation that you gave in relation to turning data into a digestible story that people can actually digest. And I feel like this captures the essence of that very well. And um, it's a great resource. That I really hope people will be able to take advantage of if you very uh, long term. Yeah, I completely agree, Alyssa. Evan did a phenomenal job and we're really grateful for getting this up and running. This has been a, a dream of the Animus River Community Forum for some time. Um, the other thing I want to say, um, so if everyone remembers over the course of the last year, we worked on putting together the 416 Recovery and Response Plan that would kind of help shape our actions moving forward. And we decided to form subcommittees to address the various um, elements of what we want to see come out of ARC Forum moving forward. And so one of those subcommittees is the communications and education and outreach that Marcel is heading up that he just spoke about. So if you're interested in seeing these kinds of questions and these kinds of topics be a part of the next version, I would love to invite you to join the subcommittee and be a part of that, that dialogue to shape it. So please uh, get in touch with me if you want to join that subcommittee and we can get you in touch with Marcel to, to, uh, to join in. So um, we are just about on schedule. Good job everyone on that. So we're going to move into our partner and committee updates. So if everyone can keep their, um, their update to, you know, two, three, four, five minutes long, that would be great. Um, we have La Plata County first on the list, and Megan Graham couldn't be here today. Is there anyone else present from the county um, that has an update? I don't really see anybody here from the county. Pardon me. Sorry, I had to sneeze. Um, so we'll move on, since we don't have a representative from La Plata County, to San Juan National Forest. And I think Cam Hooley is prepared to give that update. 
um, sort of an update to the presentation that was given at the March meeting. So Cam, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Here we go, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, this, this is just gonna be um, real brief. I think it was Emily Olson that presented at the last meeting about our fundraising efforts on the Hermosa Creek Special Management Area sign project. Um, so just a quick update is that we have been able to um, secure a few partner donations. It's not coming in real fast and that's understandable with um, everybody's financial hardships during this Corona time, but we've got a few partner donations. We, we have um, found that we have some certified welders on the forest that are actually going to do the fabrication work for the metal structures. So that's going to save us a ton of money. And we've applied for funds from several different forces, sources and we're waiting to hear back on those. So um, mainly what we have need left on is a pretty substantial fund. Um, pretty substantial funds needed to buy the steel for those kiosks. And um, that's what we're still hoping to raise some partners on. And, and so NFF, National Forest Foundation, is, has joined us as our fundraising coordinator. And so any funds that anyone wishes to donate should go through NFF, Emily Olson's. I guess, any questions about that project? Uh, Cam, can you tell us exactly where the kiosks are going to be built? Yeah, sure. So there's several locations around the special management area. Um, one will be up at the upper trailhead in Hermosa Park. One will be um, at the, as you enter the uh, special management area, as you go up through Purgatory and you break over at the Albert Creek Road Junction, that's where another one will be. And then we'll re be replacing the panels that are already on the sign that's at Lower Hermosa. And then there's uh, some other lower, uh, lower traveled areas around the other area, uh, other roads where they enter the SMA. But those are the main ones where the big kiosks will be. Great, thanks. Does anybody else have a question for Cam about the kiosk project? Yeah, Marsha, I see that she sent me a private message, so I'll get back to you, Marsha, on, on that. Great. Um, hey, this is Emily Olson. I'm joining late, but Cam just wanted to say thanks for introducing the project. And um, as Cam said, NFF's excited to partner with the San Juan National Forest on this. And um, I'm, keeping my eyes peeled for any sources we can apply to. We're able to bring a little bit of funding to start, but um, certainly open to any ideas that people have or opportunities they see for grants that might be a good fit or other funding opportunities. Um, so I'll put my email address in the chat box, but um, we're really, you know, as Kim mentioned, working hard to close that, close that gap and make the kiosks happen. Thank you so much, Emily. Thanks for giving us that information. We'll look for your email in the chat. And I, I just wanted to say a quick, at the last meeting in March, it was actually Lorena Williams that gave that presentation about the project. So if anybody remembers that, she gave a PowerPoint. Um, and then next I had Mountain Studies on our list and it was supposed to be an update from our water team on our sampling. Um, I don't see, wait, let's see, somebody just rang in. Um, so I will mention it came in the announcement for this meeting. There was a link to the presentation, <clears throat> excuse me, that Scott Roberts gave at the Animus Valley. Well, he didn't give it at the Grange. It was part of the Animus Valley Grange's speaker series. Um, all of his new data on the water quality information in the 416 area. So if you would like to see that presentation and you missed it, the link was in the previous email and we'll definitely include it in the notes when we send it out. Um, so that's maybe the best way. I'm sure Scott will be giving another talk about that data in upcoming days, but um, there's a way to see it right now if you'd like to. Um, okay, so in the chat, that's just from Emily. 
And um, does anybody else from Mountain Studies that's on want to say anything about the water quality sampling that's been happening? Okay. Um, is there a person from the BPMD CAG? I didn't see Ty that would like to give an update. I guess I might be able to give an update there, unless Ty or Peter or John Ott, some from the executive committee is on. I don't think any of them are on, so Marcel, that'd be great. Okay, and Melissa May is also on the CAG with me, so feel free to jump in if I, if I miss anything. Um, I wasn't planning on giving an update on the CAG today, but I'll do my best. Uh, um, the CAG's moving forward pretty well, I think, and working with the EPA, giving them feedback on different things. Uh, most recently, they've uh, sent us some draft chapters of their new site management plan. Uh, the the uh, Superfund team is, is pursuing this um, adaptive management um, style of managing the Superfund site up there. And we're one of, I think, only six pilot projects across the country where the EPA is trying this, this adaptive management um, piece. And so they've been sending us draft chapters of their site management plan. And the CAG is uh, finding, finalizing a letter right now that Peter Butler, the chair, is going to send to the EPA, just making sure that uh, that the community advisory group and the public at large can can plug into the process up there and make sure that EPA is being responsive to our feedback and to what direction we'd like to see the cleanup go. Um, so that's probably the the most recent update I can give uh, as far as projects at the site. EPA is going to be moving forward hopefully this summer with closing the Red and Bonita bulkhead, um, which is a pretty significant step in understanding the hydrology beneath Bonita Peak. And uh, one line of evidence for, for the EPA being responsive to feedback from the CAG is that when they initially told us of their plans to close the Red and Bonita bulkhead, um, they were only going to raise the water level by 50 feet. And a few members on the CAG thought that that might have been insufficient and that maybe they should go higher. And they're now moving um, to raise the water behind the bulkhead to 200 feet, to maybe give us a better sense of where water might go and how that impacts seeps and springs around the area um, and the overall hydrology. So, so the EPA seems to be listening to the CAG, which is great. Um, it's why, why we formed it uh, last year and uh, things are moving forward pretty smoothly, I think. I don't know, Melissa, if you have anything to add there or if I missed anything big, but I think that's, that's, that's kind of what we're working on right now. I think that's a great update. I've been honestly pretty humbled by the level of expertise on the CAG. And so I sort of sit quietly and try to absorb as much information as I can. But honestly, I think that the the level of expertise of people that have worked in the Bonita Peak Mining District and the Animus Watershed for years and years and years is, is really impressive. And so it's been great to be able to be a part of that group and just um, absorb any of their expertise that I can and hopefully EPA absorbs it as well. And I guess if you wanna learn more about the CAG, um, you can go to bonitapeakcag.org. I can put the link in the chat if that's helpful. Um, it's where we post our kind of meeting notes and, and some of the things that the CAG's working on as well as EPA documents and other partner documents. I'll put that in the chat. Thanks so much, Marcel. We appreciate that. Um, the next person on the list was Gigi with the Water Center update. Hi. Uh, great, thanks for the opportunity. Um, one of the exciting things we've got going on at Fort Lewis, um, I, I think the word is starting to spread that the college actually purchased a raft company. Um, and with that came over 50 launch days on the San Juan, as well as launch days on the Chama. So one of the things we're working on now is how do we integrate um, this really cool opportunity to get students onto the river um, across campus, uh, across disciplines, and across the diversity of our amazing student body at Fort Lewis. And it really ties in uh, well with the new strategic plan that the college has in place and with sort of the, just the spirit of um, experiential learning that exists at Fort Lewis College. So really cool opportunities to also engage the community and trips and fundraising opportunities and um, I, I think there's some, we're gonna see some neat stuff happen as a result of that. The program is called Fort Lewis on the Water. So the acronym is FLOW. So it's the FLOW program. Um, and, uh, oh shoot, I had another thought. Oh, just an update on uh, where we're headed um, for the fall from Fort Lewis perspective. 
we're, the way we're grappling with COVID, um, and I think a lot of people are interested in what's gonna happen on campus this fall, we're starting a week early so that in-person classes end the day before Thanksgiving, and then we wrap up the semester online. So the goal is to actually be on campus this fall with students um, in person. How that actually is gonna look, we don't know, and you know what it means for events like for example i think we're hosting the next animus river community forum meeting in september and whether we'll be able to actually have it in person on campus or not um we don't know yet but i will let you know as soon as i hear so thank you so much Gigi. i think we're all looking forward to days when we can have in-person meetings again yeah oh you know i should mention we also are hosting these uh, water happy hours every month um and we've been doing them virtually since march and it's really it's been a fun opportunity for people to just um talk about water issues what they're going doing in water work um in the water world and uh if you're interested in those you can go to our website and sign up for our little newsletter which goes out once a month or so um, with just some updates about what's going on and the happy hours are listed there so, and I think you guys have been spreading the word about those as well. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the next person I'm gonna call on is Anthony Culpepper for an update on the Four Rivers Collaborative. I think, thanks Amanda. Um, can you hear me? Perfect, yes. yeah, I'm having mute button issues today apparently with Zoom. Um, yeah, so a couple updates here on um, our um, local collaborative that's focused on uh, forest resilience. So um, a few folks on this uh, call are, have been a participant in the development of what was tentatively called the Columbine Collaborative. And uh, as of last week, we are now officially the Four Rivers Resilient Forest Collaborative. Um, so there was a kind of a collaborative consensus effort into developing a name. So thanks folks who uh, had input on the name process. And also as of last week, we have a, uh, a, a full strategic plan and we're starting to rip, rip along with that plan, which is great. Um, sort of as a heads up for structure for the collaborative, um, we're following more of, I think, kind of organically more of a ARC forum type model of having quarterly full stakeholder meetings, um, monthly kind of steering committee-ish meetings, and then more regular work group meetings kind of on an as need basis. So, um, that's sort of a model that the group decided that they wanted to follow suit with. So um, uh, as it stands right now, we have four uh, work groups. One is a uh, uh, community education and outreach uh, work group, which we had a nice meeting a couple of, uh, couple of days ago. Um, thanks, Paulette, I see you on here. Thanks for participating with that. Um, we have a uh, workforce development and economic sustainability work group, a planning and prior prioritization work group, and I'm actually spacing on our fourth. I think our fourth was governance, and that's gotten that's kind of gotten subsumed into the uh, um, uh, steering committee. So, a um, couple of updates pertinent to ARC Forum, um, not necessarily for the Four Rivers, but um, for uh, uh, the Environmental Impact Fund and Rocky Mountain Restoration Initiative and CLFRP um, initiatives. So I'll start with CLFRP first. Um, since there's actually some overlap with uh, pr early proposed work on the ground with that proposal um, tied to the upper animus and, or sorry, not upper animus, upper Hermosa and more of the uh, lower Hermosa areas for a couple of values. So um, that proposal is uh, going in front of the uh, FACA committee um, that's been set up by the Forest Service to select the next round of CLFRP projects and that'll occur next week and so hopefully and the very near future, um, we'll actually know if that uh, if that's being funded or not, or has the potential to be funded. There's still, you know, the, the actual funding and where it comes from is, um, you know, um, government budgets, et cetera. Um, uh, RMRI is moving along. Uh, we're getting more development and cohesion around sort of the steering committee aspect of RMRI for Southwest Colorado and expect to kind of hear um, a lot of momentum towards uh, workforce development here in the very near future. Um, I believe I saw Ellen, uh, Ellen's name on the call here. So Ellen will be helping uh, kind of lead some of those efforts, Ellen Roberts. Um, and so thanks Ellen for um, your assistance there. 
Tied to that, the Environmental Impact Fund has also received a sort of second round of uh, funding. And uh, this is really to get the impact fund up and running. And so a lot of, uh, um, a lot of hopefully near term kind of uh, momentum around that as well. Uh, another thing tied to RMRI, and I need to actually chat with Amanda a little bit about how to maybe incorporate uh, ARC Forum into this process. But RMRI is about, or the, the San Juan National Forest is um, working through its internal prioritization process for RMRI. Um, that's the Rocky Mountain Restoration Initiative, right? if I hadn't uh, been specific with that acronym. And it's revolving around the, um, what's called, what are called pods, so priority operational delineations. And these are sort of fire management units that are being developed across the forest. And um, the next iteration of that is to take what the San Juan is prioritizing and put that in front of our collaboratives. And so, um, you know, currently the collaboratives involved are very uh, forest in forest resilient focused. And so making sure the water community has, um, has an opportunity to kind of voice uh, concern, concerns, opinions, um, et cetera, on that prioritization process uh, is something that I think this uh, group would be uh, invaluable with uh, participating in. So Amanda, you and I will uh, interface on, on how that might look going forward. Um, and likely this is something just as a heads up that will be occurring within the next several weeks. So um, um, probably a pretty quick turnaround on that, unfortunately. Um, yeah, that's the, that's my update. Great, thank you. Um, does anyone have questions for Anthony? All right, um, are there other updates? Elaine, do you have a water information program? Okay, let's hear from you. Great, thanks. I can just put my hand up. I should take it off, hang on. <laughs> How do you make it go away? <laughs> no, I think it might just go away after a minute. I'm not sure. Yeah, it'll go away on its own. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, yeah, I just wanted to let people know um, what I'm working on right now on behalf of the Southwest Basin Roundtable and PEPO um, for this year's Education Action Plan that got updated as part of the update of the BIP. Um, we are working on a video that is going to be an educational video about eight minutes long. Uh, we don't have one for the Southwest Basin, so I got approval on that for the PEPO funds from C CWCB, and then the Water Information Program is gonna fund um, a good chunk of that as well. We are already in the production phases and have done interviews. The, the, it's hard to in, put in eight minutes of everything that's happening in our basins and our sub-basins, our sub-districts, but the focus is gonna be on forest health, river health, agriculture, riparian, and how they all tie together to make our basin what it is. Um, we've, we've already interviewed Ellen Roberts. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, and we've talked to Mike Preston and RMRI and some of the forest uh, health issues that are happening. We've talked to Aaron Kempel from MSI. We went out to the Hermosa area. We're gonna be talking to Amanda about riparian um, and you know how to have a healthy, vibrant riparian corridor and, and some of the projects that have happened within that. We're including both tribes. We've got hopefully, I think Lorelei Cloud from the Tribal Council for the Ute Tribe is gonna be doing some of our narration and intros. And we are going out to the um, Farm and Ranch Enterprise out in Toak with Eric White for the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, talk about agriculture. And we're also gonna be heading up to the San Miguel um, and talk to Elizabeth Stuffing uh, with the San Miguel Watershed uh, Coalition, as well as a really cool different per, uh, farming concept, which is the Indian Ridge Farm up in Norwood. They're all organic, um, totally solar. And so just trying to be very inclusive of everybody in our basin and, and pull it all together. We're hoping to have it completed in November. It will be free for anybody to use. So hopefully for the Four Corners Water Center um, to use and show as education to and all the schools we're gonna send it out to. It'll be a link on the WIP website, the SWCD website, the round table page, and I'll do when it's done a launch in the newsletter for the link. So pretty excited about that. It's, um, it's something that I think really is gonna feature our basin that hasn't been done before. So 
that my update and of course uh, working with Amanda on the Forest of Fawcett's teacher training program which we've had some really good response we are going to do a, an in-person training that we're being very conscious of safety and such and I think some people are going to be driving themselves and doing mostly everything outdoors so excited to have that program still move forward and then not sure what I'm going to do with my Water 101, 201. Um, it might be virtual, it might be live. That's something that's happening in the fall. So we'll keep you yeah, posted. And that's it. Elaine, I wonder, is there a general um, theme or message to the video? Yeah, um, it's in the script. There's going to be a lot of narration, but basically it's it's, you know, talking about the Southwest Basin's watershed, what they provide, you know, who they are, um, the diverse land use and land cover, public and private lands, forest health, river health, water storage, water quality, um, agriculture, you know, how, how water dependent they are on that, um, river health, investing in our rivers and investment in the future, and we're talking about you know, river health improvements, um, having mountain studies speak to some of the watershed stream management. Um, so oh, I'm also interviewing Celine from the Nature Conservancy, talking about some of the projects that we've done along the rivers. Um, and agriculture's reliance on healthy river systems, water availability, ag efficiency projects. So trying to cram all that into an eight minute video is <laughs> becoming a challenge, but we're gonna try to you know, really make it educational. We're also going to open with a bang. Like, I don't want it to be just, it's going to be very little talking heads and a lot more narration. And we're going to also talk about tourism. We're going to talk about recreation, you know, with a lot of visuals on that through the narration piece. And then go into what are some of the key issues that climate change is, is causing for us within the forest health, river health, and ag communities. Awesome. Thanks. I look forward to seeing it. Yeah, it's a big project. Elaine, where do people see your video? Uh, when it's done um, in November, hopefully, um, as I mentioned, it's going to be on the website. It'll be on the roundtable page. It will be on the SWCD website. And I'm also going to do a blast out in the newsletter with the link. And then anybody can use it. It's free. Um, could send you the link. Anybody that wants it will send the link to. And you know, anybody who's doing a presentation and want to do a, a quick intro of the basin, it could be used for that. It could be used for teachers. Um, so it, hopefully, you know, many uses. Right now it's so abstract. <laughs> it, the editing is going to be a good brunt of this to have all the stories tie together and some great scenic shots. And we're using drone, but you know, poor Ellen, the day we did the interview was the only day we had rain. And now we're planning on shooting next week and now we have a fire. So <laughs> I'm like, oh boy, trying to get drone shots and really good scenics in the smoke is gonna be a bit challenging, but we're plotting forward. Well, thank you. We're all looking forward to that. I'm sure yeah. that'll be a feature at a future ARC Forum meeting. Yeah, definitely yeah. view it and show it for that. Yeah. Um, so anybody else with an update? Jared, is there anything from the city? Um, I mean, for our part, we, uh, we are surviving COVID, uh, continuing to provide clean water, um, potable water, which is important. Um, and really uh, just, just keeping things running and, and preparing, frankly, for drought. Um, you know, the, the Animus at Durango is running, you know, less than a quarter of its, uh, of its regular flow. The Florida is down as well. I think uh, those are the challenges we have. Um, so I'm excited for monsoons and, and agree with Gigi. Uh, I hope they don't come too, uh, too heavily, uh, but they can't come quickly enough. Um, so that's, that's really our efforts is, uh, um, just keeping an eye. We're completing a few projects. Um, we obviously finished our river work um, earlier this spring and it seems to be working for us. Um, you know, and so we're, we're just keep on moving ahead. Um, and I see the work in the river. Uh, question from Buck. Um, 
you know, it, it did work for us. We, we, I, I think, you know, and it would be up to the boater community. Uh, a lot of what we did was to re, um, to fix some sills uh, that support our main diversion structure uh, and make them more passable. Um, I think it has done that, but again, one of the big tests was supposed to be 4,000, 5,000 CFS and that just didn't happen, isn't going to happen this year, obviously. So uh, I think we had one day where it really jumped, um, but that's about it. And that was a rain event. So um, I think the, the structure in, in the Animus has worked well, um, you know, and well, it's kind of a wait and see kind of approach. Um, we'll see what happens with our next water year. Um, I tell you, people are boating. Um, our parking lot is real busy down there. Um, so that continues to move ahead, so. Great, thank you. All right, um, it's exactly 4.31, so we've done well at keeping on time. Does anybody else have an, uh, an update they wanna say before we break? Um, yeah, this is Alyssa. I would like to give one update before we bounce off. Okay. Um, so for the, the watershed group, we're currently in the um, uh, outreach phase with stakeholders and doing riparian assessments, um, specifically in the Cedar Hill area to identify new projects. So I've been reaching out to um, the previous coordinator before me, Kurt Imhoff, shout out to Kurt, um, through a water weeds and wildlife workshop last year. And I've been reinitiating contact with all of them. And Ben Bloodworth from Rivers Edge West is actually going to be coming down to join us to do some assessments with some people from the workshop um, the week of July 1st. And so I wanted to bring let you know that you guys are that is going on and in case anyone in the future is interested in coming out for a repair and assessment and some field time, um, uh, let me know. That's great. Alyssa, will you put in the chat where people can find out more about that if they want to get involved? Sure, sure. Yeah, I'll link uh, my email address and then the uh, watershed website, watershed group website. Great, thank you. Um, so before we go, I will just say quickly that um, our next meeting is planned for September 17th. I'm sure that might change if, uh, if it has to, but that's what we've got on the calendar at the moment, and we'll see if we can actually be in person. And then when Evan was talking about the story map, oh, the last thing, I also wanted to put the story map is available on the ARC Forum website, and I'm putting that in the chat right now. So if you have not been to the Animus River Community Forum website, please, when you click on the R Animus, you can look at it as a PDF of the paper publication, or you can look at the story map that Evan showed. And it's also available at Mountain Studies website, as Evan mentioned. But when he showed that map and he showed you all of the acknowledgements and sponsors for the first version of the R Animus, we are, of course, now taking sponsorships for the second version of the R Animus for the update. So if you're interested as an organization or even an individual, um, we really accept donations at all levels to help pay for the production of that next version. And this includes design and um, incorporating the new data, um, hiring a graphic designer to put it all together and make it look really beautiful, all of those things. Um, we're starting that process now because it will be probably more than a year before we actually have the next paper copy in our hands. Um, there are forms to fill out that I'm, you might have seen at previous meetings and I'll include a copy of that form for making the donation and becoming truly a member of the Animus River Community Forum. I'll um, include that document with the notes that we'll email out after this meeting. So please keep that in mind if you'd like to continue to be a member of the forum. Um, so I think that's it. We're only four minutes past our allotted time. I wanna thank all the speakers. Thank you to Jordan for that excellent presentation and to Evan for showing us the story map and uh, Melissa and Warren for talking with us about the Animus Watershed Partnership and thanks to all the partners that gave um, great updates today. So thank you and we hope to see you in September and please watch your inbox for the notes for this meeting. Thanks. <laughs>